Hello, today we're continuing with our series on GCSE Physics Revision and this time we're going to be looking at optical lenses. Now you'll recall from our video on refraction that when light passes from one medium such as air into another medium such as glass it refracts which means it bends, it changes direction. So the incident ray comes in like this but at the surface it then refracts and goes through a different angle. All of that is covered in the previous video on refraction. But we now want to take this principle of air, of light passing from air into glass and bending and shaping our glass in a particular way into a shape which is called a lens and this is called a convex lens or sometimes a converging lens and we design it in such a way that light that is coming from a distant thing we usually say from infinity but what we really mean is light that's coming from a long way away such as a tree and therefore all the rays of light can be regarded as pretty much traveling parallel to one another as that light hits this lens it will refract and the lens is designed in such a way that all the light refracts to a particular point which is called the focal point, sometimes called the principal focus. The line that runs through the middle here we call the axis or the principal ac axis and this as I've said is the lens or in this case converging lens. What you will find is that if you have, here is my principal axis, here is my lens, what you will find is that if you have, say, a tree a long way away, so that effectively the light that is reaching the lens is coming parallel to the principal axis, then that light will focus at the focal point, and if you bring a screen up to that focal point, you will actually see that tree but it will be upside down. So there will be a real image of that tree, it will be on the other side of the lens and it will be inverted or upside down. Now of course the object might not be a long long way away so the rays may not be coming parallel. So we've really got to see what the effect of a lens is for different circumstances depending on what the object, we always call this the object and we always call what you get the image. So we want to see what happens when the object is placed at varying distances from the lens. And to do that you need to know how to draw what are called ray diagrams and they couldn't be simpler. You start with your axis or your principal axis and you have your lens which is, of course is a converging lens and all you need to do is to draw two rays. We'll call this the focal point. The first ray, here is, here is my object which is simply going to be an arrow. Right. The first ray I draw parallel to the principal axis. Okay. Now what do we know about parallel light? Light that's coming parallel to the principal axis, well I've already told you what happens to that, it gets refracted through the focal point. So if this is the focal point, the refraction, I'll just use a ruler so that I don't mess it up, the refracted light will go down there, through the focal point. The other line I can draw is a line that goes from the top of the object straight through the center of the, the lens and out the other side. So that looks like this. I only wish I could draw a straight line. Now guess what happens where the two overlap? Yes you've got it, that's where the image is formed but you'll notice that it's upside down. So this is the way that you can always find out where the image forms by this ray diagram. Two lines, remember the first goes parallel to the principal axis and is then refracted through the focal point. 
The other one just goes straight through the center of the lens, the point on the principal axis, straight out the other side. And where the two cross, you get an image. In this case, it's a real image, because if you brought a screen up here, you would see that arrow on the screen upside down. Now there's a formula that not all of you will need to know, but I'm gonna tell you what it is anyway. The distance from the lens to the focal point is called the focal length, and it's given the letter F. The distance from the object to the lens is given the letter U, and the distance of the image to the lens is given the letter V. All right, it's quite simple. The length from the lens to the focal point is called the focal length. The length from the object to the lens is U, the object length, the length from the image to the lens is the image length V. And these are related in this formula that one over U plus one over V equals one over F. So if you know two of those three, you can actually do a calculation to work out the third. But if you don't need to know that formula, then you have to do it by using well-drawn ray diagrams, and that is precisely what I'm going to do. In fact, what I'm going to do is do both. I'm going to do a ray diagram, and then I'm going to do a calculation to show that we were right. And I'm going to look at four specific instances. The first is when the object is more than twice the focal length away from the lens. So there's the principal axis, there's the lens. Let's say those are the focal points. Remember the focal points will be on both sides of the lens because if light is coming from this direction it will be focused here. If light is coming from this direction it will be focused here. So if that is the focal point I can mark twice the focal length. So that's twice the focal length. And what I'm saying is that the object is beyond twice the focal length. That's my first scenario. So what do I do? I draw the usual diagrams, the ray diagrams, which means I need a line that's parallel, oh dear, parallel to the principal axis that is then refracted through the focal point. And the second line I need is straight through the lens and out the other side. And where the two overlap is where you get your image which you'll notice is upside down. Now you'll also notice something else. It's less than twice the focal length. It's actually between the focal length and twice the focal length. So when the object is more than twice the focal length away, the image is less than twice the focal length away from the lens. And you'll also notice that the image is smaller than the object. And of course, it's inverted. But it is real. If I brought a screen at this point, then that object would appear as an image, sorry, that image would appear on the screen. So now I'm going to prove that, as it were, with the formula. Since u has to be more than 3f, let us, for example, for this purpose, assume, sorry, u has to be more than 2f, let us assume that u equals 3f, then we use the formula 1 over u plus 1 over v equals 1 over f, that means that 1 over 3f, because u is 3f, plus 1 over v equals 1 over f, that means that rearranging 1 over v equals 1 over f minus 1 over 3f, which we can write as, let's use the common denominator as 3f, so that's 3 minus 1 is 2 over 3f, and that's 1 over v, so if you tip them both upside down, you get that v is 3f over 2, which is 1.5f. And that's exactly what we uh, see here, that we've got a object that is beyond twice the focal length and the image is between the focal length and twice the focal length and that's exactly what we've got here it's 1.5 times the focal length 
distant from the lens because V, remember, is the distance of the image from the lens. So my ray diagram and my formula have coincided. Thank goodness for that. My second scenario is that U, that is the distance of the object from the lens, is precisely twice the focal length. So we'll start off by doing the ray diagram and then we'll use the formula. So here's the principal axis. Here is the lens. Here is the focal point on either side of the lens. And here is twice the focal length. And I'm telling you that on this occasion, the object is exactly twice the focal length away from the uh, lens. So once again, I've got to draw my ray diagram. So the first ray goes parallel to the principal axis and then straight, it's refracted through the focal point. And the second ray goes straight through the center of the lens and out the other side. And guess what? The image forms at exactly twice the focal length on the other side of the lens. So when the object is precisely at twice the focal length, the image is also precisely at twice the focal length, but on the other side, and it is upside down, so it's inverted, and you may notice, you might not realize it from this, but in fact, it will be exactly the same size as the object, and it's real. That is to say, if you bring a screen up, you will see that image on the screen. So I better show that that is true according to the formula. Well, remember what the formula was, one over u, plus one over V equals one over F. Reminder, U is the distance of the object from the lens, V is the distance of the image from the lens, and F is the distance of the focal point from the lens. So we've already said what U is, it is equal to exactly twice the focal length. So we've now got that one over two F plus one over V equals one over F. Rearrange and you get that one over V is equal to one over F minus one over two F. And if we make the common denominator 2f, we've got 2 minus 1, and that's going to be 1 over 2f. So 1 over v is 1 over 2f. If we just invert both sides, we get that v is 2f, which is what I was trying to show in the first place, that when the object is placed precisely at twice the focal length in front of the lens, the image is twice the focal length behind the lens. So here is my third set of circumstances. On this particular occasion, the object is somewhere between the focal length and twice the focal length. So first of all, we do the famous ray diagram. Here is the principal axis. Here is the lens. Here is the focal point. Here is twice the focal point. And I'm telling you that it's somewhere between the focal point and twice the focal point. So let's stick it here. This is the object. Somewhere between the focal point and twice the focal point. Again, I need to draw my ray diagram. I go to the, first of all, I draw the parallel ray, parallel to the principal axis. And that, of course, is always going to be refracted through the focal point. The second ray that I draw, of course, goes straight through the centre of the lens and out the other side. Now look and see where we've got to. We've now got an image which is here. The image is beyond twice the focal length. What can we say about the image? Firstly, it's inverted. Secondly, it's beyond twice the focal length. Thirdly, it's bigger than the object. The image is bigger. And fourthly, it's real in that if you bring a screen up at this point, you will see that image on the screen. And just to show that the formula will come up with the same trumps, I'm going to assume that since U is between F and 2F, let's assume it's 1.5F. I'm just going to demonstrate that that will give us the result that we want. The result, of course, that V, the distance of the image from the lens, will be greater than 
2f. Let's see if that's true. Once again, 1 over u plus 1 over v equals 1 over f. u is now 1.5f, so 1 over 1.5f plus 1 over v equals 1 over f. Rearranging, I get that 1 over v is equal to 1 over f minus 1 over 1.5f, which is equal to, what, what should we use? We'll use 3f as the common denominator. So 1 over f is the same as 3 over 3f, minus 1 over 1.5f is the same as 2 over 3f, and that equals 1 over 3f. So 1 over v equals 1 over 3f means that v is equal to 3f, which means, as I said, the image will be further than 2f from the lens. In this case, the one that I happened to have chosen, it was three times the focal length. And now prepare yourself for the fourth example, which might blow your mind, because now I'm going to say that the, Im the object is less than the focal length. So you place the object inside the focal length of the lens. So I've drawn the principal axis, there's the lens, there's, let's say, the focal point. Here, just out of interest, is twice the focal point, although I'm not too interested in that for this example. And I'm going to put the object inside the focal point. So I'm going to put it here. That's my object. Now I draw my ray diagrams again. First ray goes parallel to the principal axis to the lens and is then refracted through the focal point. The second goes straight through the lens and out the other side. And now you see we've got a problem because those two, lens, those two rays are diverging. They are never going to meet. At least they're never going to meet this way. But if we project them upwards, and I'm not sure whether I've drawn the diagram well enough to enable me to do this, but I'm just projecting these rays upwards. Of course, there's no light going up this way. I'm just doing a straight projection using my ruler. You'll notice that although they don't meet down here, they do meet up here at this point here. And that is called a virtual image. Because if you are looking from here, this is your eye, if you are, oh sorry, you can't see my eye, there's my eye, I'm looking there. It looks as though the light is coming from an image which is here. But it's not a real image. Because if I put a screen there, I wouldn't see anything. The reason I wouldn't see anything is there's no light there. It only appears that there's light there because my eye sees these light rays coming like this and it looks as though they must have emerged from a point up here. They haven't, but that's just the illusion of what's happened with the lens. So you've got a virtual image. What else can we say about it? Firstly, it's the right way up. It's the same way up as the object. Secondly, it's magnified very much larger. It's on the same side of the lens as the object, whereas all the other images, remember, were on the other side. This one's on the same side. But as I've said, it's virtual in the sense that you can't get it on a screen. It's called a virtual image because your eye perceives that that is where the image, the image is formed. And again, I guess you'll want me to show that this works with the formula. So since the whole point about this is that u is less than the focal length, let's assume that u is equal to 0.5, half the focal length, just to demonstrate what happens. So now we need our formula again, 1 over u plus 1 over v is 1 over f. That means that if u is 0.5f, then 1 over u is 1 over 0.5f plus 1 over v, sorry, equals 1 over f. Rearrange, you get that 1 over v equals 1 over f minus 1 over 0.5 f, which is, let's put everything over f. We've got 1 over f is, is here, minus 
1 over 0.5f is the same as 2 over f. And that equals minus 1 over f. So 1 over v equals minus 1 over f, which means that v is equal to minus f. What on earth does the minus mean there? We've never had a minus before. Well, that's what tells us that the image is on the same side as the lens, because when v was positive, it was on this side of the lens. When v is negative, it means it's on this side of the lens. So that minus sign is the mathematics, sorry, this minus sign here is the mathematics telling us that it's a virtual image, it's on the same size of, uh, same side of the lens as the object, and in this particular case, when u was 0.5f, the image is formed actually at the focal point. But that need not be the case for other values of u within the focal length. So far, we've been talking about a converging lens. There is such a thing as a diverging lens. Here's the principal axis. The diverging lens, instead of being convex, is essentially concave. And what this means is that if you take parallel lines of light, so in other words, light that's coming from a distant object where effectively you can regard the uh, light as parallel to the parallel uh, to the principal axis. Whereas a converging lens would cause this to converge to the focal point, a diverging lens causes it to diverge. So clearly there's never going to be a focal point on this side of the lens. But if we project backwards, you will see that it looks as though this light has emerged from a focal point. It hasn't, but if you were looking at it, that's where you would think it had come from. And so you get a virtual focal point in a concave or diverging lens. You still use the formula, if you are using the formula, that 1 over u plus 1 over v equals 1 over f, but where you've got a virtual focal point, f will be negative. So you use minus a focal length rather than plus a focal length, and then you will always get the right answers. So by way of an illustration, here's the principal axis, here's the diverging lens, here is the object, and now we draw again the two rays, in this case it will be a parallel ray which we know will be diverted away, but diverted as if it had come from the focal point. So this is what the actual ray does, but it looks as though it's come from the focal point, which is the virtual focal point. The other ray, you do exactly the same as you did before. You take it through the middle of the lens and out the other side. So there's no change there. So this one, instead of converging to the focal point, diverges, but it diverges away from the virtual focal point. This one just goes straight through the middle of the lens, and where the two cross, you get your image. And what you'll notice about that image is, firstly, it's the right way up. Secondly, it's a virtual image. It's virtual because you haven't got two rays of actual light. One ray of light is there, but the other one is actually not a real ray of light. It was just a projection. So where you've got projections, you don't get real images. So this is a virtual image. It's the same way up, and you'll notice it's very, very much smaller than the object. The image is smaller than the object. And finally, it's on the same size as the, of the lens as the object. So in this case, u would be positive, because as usual, it is the distance from the lens to the object. f would be negative, because it is the virtual focal point. And you would also find that in these circumstances, v would be negative, which tells you that it's a virtual image. We've seen in the various examples that we've shown that the image height 
is not necessarily the same as the object height. Sometimes it's bigger and sometimes it's smaller. We can introduce a concept called magnification. Magnification is the ratio of the image height to the object height. So if the image is bigger than the object, that has been magnified. And what I can also tell you is that that is the same as the image distance from the lens divided by the object distance from the lens. I can kind of prove that to you fairly simply, I think, if this is the lens, this is the object, this is the image. If I draw just a straight line here, I'm not saying this is a ray, I'm just drawing a line. Straight line should have been. That angle is alpha, that angle is also alpha. This is the image height, this is the object height. This is the object distance u, this is the image distance v. I think you can see that the tangent of angle on, uh, of alpha on this side is O over U, the object height divided by the object distance. The tangent of alpha on this side is also I over V. So consequently, O over U, which is the tangent of alpha, equals I over V, which is the tangent of alpha. And if you rearrange that, you get that I divided by O, the image height divided by the object height, is equal to the image, sorry, the image distance divided by the object distance. If you look back at the four examples I gave when we used a converging lens, you'll find that only two of them resulted in images which were bigger than the objects. That was when either the object distance was less than 2f, but greater than f, or when the object distance was less than f itself. So if you like, you can say that whenever the object distance is less than 2f, you will get magnification. In the first case, this one here, when the object was between the focal length and twice the focal length, you will recall that we got a real magnified image. When the object length was less than the focal length, you will recall that we got a virtual image. So let's just remind you with a ray diagram of a magnifying glass. A magnifying glass, you usually have to get very close to the object that you're looking at. So typically, you are within the focal length of the magnifying glass lens. So there it is. You draw one ray which is parallel to the principal axis and through the focal point. You draw the other ray which goes through the center of the lens. And of course, they are diverging. You won't, they won't ever meet this way, but you project backwards and that produces a virtual image which is magnified because obviously it's bigger it's on the same side of the lens and it's the same way up. So if you're looking at it from your eye here, what you will perceive is that there is a virtual image because that's what the light looks as though it's come from. It hasn't, but it looks as though it has, and it's magnified. So this is how a magnifying glass works. You look at the object, the object is within the focal length, you get a virtual image, which is the same way up, and is magnified. A projector, by contrast, which is where you project something onto the wall, needs a real image because you want the image to form on the wall. So you can't use magnifying technique because that just produces a virtual image. There won't be anything to see on, on a screen. So now you'll need the other technique. This is where the object has to be placed somewhere between the focal length and twice the focal length. And in those circumstances, if we draw firstly the ray which goes parallel to the principal axis and down through the focus, and then the second one which goes straight through the lens, um, I've not drawn that properly because of course it should actually come out beyond, if I'd drawn it with a ruler, it would have come out beyond twice the focal length. But the critical thing is of course, that it will be bigger. Unfortunately, it will also be upside down. 
so your audience will have to stand on their heads. The way this is solved, of course, is that you, if you're projecting an image, you actually have to have, sorry, if you're projecting an object, you actually have to have the object upside down such that the image that goes on the screen is the right way up. And here's a screen, it's now a, it's now a real image, you can see it. It's the right way up because the object was upside down by definition, by design. It's beyond twice the focal length and it's magnified. That's the way a projector works. The power of a lens is described as one divided by the focal length of the lens. Since the focal length of a lens is in metres, you might think that power is measured in metres to the minus one. But in fact, there is a term we use for power of a lens. It's called a diopter. So quite simply, if the focal length is five centimetres of a lens, then the power is going to be one over f. We must convert to metres. So that's one over 0 0.05, which is 20 diopters. So that's the power of the lens. You'll notice that since power is one over f, it's one of those situations where if the, free, if the focal length goes down, the power goes up. If this number, the denominator, gets smaller, this number gets bigger. So if you want a really powerful lens, you need a lens which has got a very small focal length. Those are more difficult lenses to produce because, of course, lenses with a small focal length require a lot of refraction. You've effectively got to bend the lens, sorry, bend the light a lot to get it to go through a short focal length. If you want it to go through a long focal length, it doesn't have to bend so much. But the shorter you make the focal length, the more the light has to bend. And that means you either need a material with a very high refractive index, N, or you need to make the lens very thick so that you get a lot of, um, a lot of change of direction of the light. And both of those tend to make the lens more difficult to make or uh, more expensive. I now want to look at a very particular lens arrangement, the one in your eye. Your eye is broadly kind of circular shaped like this, and it will have a lens. There's the lens. It's a convex lens. Um, the screen is essentially the back of your eye. It's slightly curved, but we don't call it a screen. We call it a retina. So that's at the back of the eye, and that's, uh, that's got lots of little nerve cells that will pick up light signals. And of course, what we need to do is to focus the light onto the back of the retina, onto the screen. And you'll notice that that is where the image will form. And the distance from the image to the lens is the length which we have hitherto called as V. And the important thing about that is that V cannot change. The, the, the distance from the lens to the back of your eye is fixed. So consequently, since you will be looking at things at different distances in front of your eye, it means the lens needs to change its focal length so that it can make sure that the focus is always on your retina. And that is achieved by muscles which hold the lens in place. They are called ciliary muscles. And what they do is they push or pull and they vary the thickness of the lens so that that varies the focal point such that the image is always projected precisely onto the back of your eye. In front of your eye there will be a thing called an iris which is essentially a shutter. It, is, it blocks off to stop too much light getting in otherwise you might get um, dazzled. Um, and that iris can either go very small if, for example, you're in strong sunlight, or it can go very wide if you're in a dark room. So the iris adjusts to let the amount of light in, and the gap in the middle is called the pupil. Protecting all of this is another device called a cornea, which is a kind of transparent material sitting in front of the whole of the eye. 
and the cornea also contributes to the focusing of the lens. So the light is refracted as it goes through the cornea and further refracted as it goes through the lens. So the combination of the two refractions is what produces the image on the back of the eye. But the key thing to remember here is that the image distance cannot change because you can't change the distance between the screen, as it were, the retina and the lens. Therefore, the focal length of the lens has to change so as to ensure that no matter what, where the object is in front of your eye, it always focuses on your retina. A camera does precisely the same sort of thing. A camera will have a lens um, and at the back of the lens will be either the film, if you're talking about the old days, or some kind of sensor device if you're talking about digital technology. But once again, you can't vary the distance between the lens and the film, so V is essentially fixed. Consequently, you need to change the focal length of the lens, and you don't do that by squashing the lens, you do that by moving the lens in or out, slightly further away, slightly nearer to the back of the camera, so that the image is always properly focused onto the film or the sensory device at the back. Like an eye, the lens will also have an iris, that is something that controls the amount of light that can come in, although we don't call this now the pupil. And of course, it's also going to be the case that if the image is one way up, sorry, if the object is one way up, the image on the film will be upside down. So when you take the film out of the camera, you'll have to turn it upside down to get the right way up. Incidentally, your eye does the same. If the object is the right way up, which of course it generally is, then the image on the back of your, reti on the back of your retina will be upside down, but your brain converts it and puts it the right way up, so you don't see everybody walking about upside down. Let's just deal with two common eye defects. Here is your eye with a lens. We won't worry about all the other stuff. The key thing is that for some people, they cannot focus onto the back of their retina here. This is where they should focus. This is as far as they can focus. They can focus anywhere here, but they can't focus beyond. That's called short-sightedness. The, the lens has somehow failed and the light is not focusing on the back of the retina. To correct that, we need a divergent lens, a concave lens, and what that will do is to make the light spread out. And we'll assume it's still hitting the lens, but it's spread out a bit. And now the lens, when it causes the light to focus, will focus it further back because the light is now diverging more than it was before. So consequently, the focal point will be, or the focus will be further away than it was before. So the way to cure short-sightedness, by and large, is with a concave or a diverging lens. The second common problem, I'll leave that diagram there and try and draw the other one immediately underneath it. The second problem with, um, with the eye is what's called long-sightedness. Now in that case, the lens focuses way beyond the back of the eye. It can focus anywhere beyond that point, but it can't focus any closer. So consequently, you've got a dull image on your retina. You need it to focus here. That's called long-sightedness. And the way you correct that, here's the light coming in, the way you correct that is with a convex lens. Because what the convex lens, of course, will do is to cause the light to, to just divert in a bit. And that will make it easier for your lens in your eye to focus on the back of your eye. So short-sightedness means that the focus is in front of the retina and therefore you need a diverging lens to, as it were, make it have to go further. In the case of long-sightedness, the focus is beyond your retina and you need to pull it in a bit and you do that by using a convex lens which will cause the light to um, refract inwards, making it easier for your eye to focus on your retina. Finally, just to mention that we said that there was um, a cornea around or in front of your eye, that can sometimes um, become corrupted. 
um, and indeed its contribution to focusing, I said that it together with the lens was responsible for focusing on the retina. Sometimes that cornea um, can uh, not focus properly, not do its job properly. And one way to solve that is the use of lasers. We've covered lasers and I explained how lasers can be used to cut through things. Um, they can often be used to cut through flesh. It's called cauterize. It means both cutting and also sealing the blood vessels when you do it. But one particular use of uh, lasers is to, um, as it were, readjust the cornea so that if the cornea was in such a way that you weren't being properly focused, laser surgery can adjust the size and shape of the cornea so that now you can focus. And people who used to wear glasses um, because they've got one of these problems, but if that problem was largely caused by the cornea rather than the lens, then if you can use a laser to reshape the cornea, then you can focus um, the light on the retina. And people in those circumstances no longer have to use glasses or spectacles.